One of the things that remains in terms of the whole COVID situation is uncertainty. A great deal of uncertainty and a lot of mixed messages that we'll get from various assorted experts and various media sources. So it's, it's a little confusing and uh, I will try to sort out some of that, but my takeaway is still that there's a lot of uncertainty. Give you an example. Uh, you know, we're all following very carefully what direction all the statistics are going. And uh, yesterday, uh, I, I get these alerts from the uh, Sun Sentinel since I signed up uh, for the uh, one cent a day rate for the next six months. So they're sending me all kinds of updates and alerts. So there was uh, kind of a headline that said how the uh, decrease, there was a decrease in new cases last week over the week before. And this was a very positive trend. Push this button to find out more, the link. So when I went to the link, it was a different headline there. And it said how uh, on Monday, I think it was Tuesday, actually, on yesterday, uh, they reported 83 COVID-related deaths for the state of Florida, which actually was the most ever reported in one day. And there were 708 new cases on Monday, which was a very relatively... Uh, high amount. So it's to me, again, the uncertainty and the confusion. And if you uh, have it on your computer, you can check from the uh, State Department of Health, a really good uh, website with all kinds of graphs and things that gives you all kinds of statistics. But it also gets a little confusing. They have daily bar graphs broken down for the whole state and the county. So you can look and see how many new cases are reported each day, uh, how many new deaths are registered each day, but they have those bar graphs and they also have what they call a seven day moving average, which is another line that you can follow. So as I learned uh, years ago in statistics, you can always manipulate the statistics to make whatever message you want to make. Here. So, you know, with that in mind, again, I say it's a little confusing, a little uncertain, uh, if we look at the latest uh, bar graphs, we're showing still that the uh, averages in the state of Florida are about 40 to 50 deaths a day. And that's been more or less consistent if you average that over the last uh, week or two. Uh, if we go, I think we mentioned last week, we discussed there's different rating agencies that, uh, that look at all these numbers. The one that uh, the federal government and our state government, a lot of people reference the most is the one from the University of Washington Medical School, which is the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation. I think I got that right without writing it down. And uh, they change their predictions uh, pretty frequently. They now, the latest prediction is that there's going to be 1,914 deaths in Florida by June 25th. But then they say it could actually be anywhere from 1,165 to 4,697. So again, it's like pick the number that you're most comfortable with, perhaps. Uh, if, we, if we take a look at the United States, uh, as of a day or two ago, we went over the 1 million mark in terms of identified cases of COVID. There have been approximately uh, 57,000 deaths. So we have more recorded deaths than any other country in the world. In Florida, the latest figures stand at slightly over 33,000 reported cases uh, from testing and approximately uh, a little bit over 1,200 deaths. In Palm Beach County specifically, the last numbers that I looked at showed that we had approximately uh, 2,900 positive identified cases, 416 individuals who've been hospitalized, and we have 178 uh, deaths in Palm Beach County that have been recorded. So those are kind of the raw numbers. And I think my take is that the trend is certainly um, uh, stabilizing, perhaps reducing a little bit, but you're still getting a fair number of new cases uh, and a fair number of deaths. And there's been a lot of a question as to, again, why, why the data is varying like that. And one of the explanations is, that the deaths don't get all reported at once, and sometimes it takes a few days or longer for uh, all of that information to be reconciled. So I, I think the data is somewhere close to the reality, and I, I think the really good news is that we have never spiked 
to an extent that exceeded our capacity. That was the original fear a few weeks or a month ago that we'd have uh, so many serious cases that we wouldn't have enough hospital beds for that. So we've succeeded very well with that. Largely, I think, to uh, some very excellent uh, local and regional uh, leadership, government leadership, and uh, people, particularly in South Florida, who've been following the suggested rules for the social distancing, wearing masks, and so on and so forth. So with that in mind, as a backdrop, the, the latest thing in the news that we've heard about lately is this uh, lifting of the restrictions. In fact, uh, it was just in the last hour that the governor uh, had a press conference where he announced that he will be reopening most of the state on Monday, with the exception of uh, South Florida. So with the exception of Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, and Broward counties, uh, going to what they call the, uh, the phase one process. And he, he said um, for the counties down here, uh, he expects to be able to move to what he calls phase one real soon. The reason that uh, all the restrictions are a little bit stringent for our area is because, again, statistically, uh, South Florida, the three counties in South Florida, amount to about 60% of the deaths, about 60% of the statewide cases, but we're only 30% of the population. So things are a little, a little more concerning in our part of the state. Uh, specifically, uh, for the rest of the state, they announced, the government announced that restaurants and retail stores will open, I believe that's as of next week, at a 25% capacity. If local governments allow it, again, it doesn't include our county. We won't be in that category, just the rest of the state. Uh, the question with hospitals and surgery centers, they'll be able to uh, return to non-essential elective procedures. Uh, from, from what I read and what I heard, it wasn't clear how we're affected by that, though I know a lot of uh, individuals now are being scheduled for previously postponed procedures here in Palm Beach County. So I think we're moving in that direction. And again, um, the, the whole movement is pretty cautious because uh, with, with the hospitals and the surgery centers, they're only permitted to begin to lift those restri restrictions if they have sufficient supplies, should there be a surge down the road. Uh, also for the whole state, no gyms or barbershops or hair salons uh, will be part of this first phase. And Palm Beach County, as you know, opened today, opened some of the uh, restrictions. Uh, they lifted uh, some of the uh, limits uh, on golf courses, boat ramps, marinas, pools in the multifamily developments, tennis courts. Uh, beaches and playgrounds for, are uh, still closed, Palm Beach County. And they are, uh, with these lifting of the restrictions uh, in certain uh, areas, there are some very stringent mandates to continue social distancing. And uh, from, I know law enforcement has threatened that there will be uh, misdemeanor charges filed on people who are violating those things. So I think the real question with this in mind is, is, is it safe to be doing this? And there's, there's a lot of opinions. I, I think the good news is that it seems that we are moving at not a highly rapid pace here in South Florida. So we have a lot of people who are staying on top of the statistics. Uh, and as I mentioned, things seem to be, for the most part, uh, even the most uh, cynical person looking at the data could say that things seem to be pretty much on average stabilizing, if not going down a little bit. And as we've discussed in the past, there's a lot of other concerns besides just health concerns. There's you know, economic concerns. There are mental health concerns. So putting that all together, it makes some sense, I would say, that we're moving in a good direction, but we need to really stay very carefully on top of it. And from what I can see, uh, we have some, some great leadership, particularly locally, that's staying on top of that. So, you know, the, the real question as to whether it's safe kind of ties into this concept of uh, what you may have heard in the past, uh, developing of herd immunity. And herd immunity is when a large percentage of the population have antibodies in their body so that uh, basically as an individual, you won't either get infected or be able to transmit it to others. You know, these antibodies could come from, you know, a, a baby could get that from his mom's antibodies when he's born. Uh, it could be from exposure to the disease, in this case, exposure to COVID could produce those antibodies. It could be from the transfusions that are, are being used on a very limited basis of the gamma globulins, or through vaccines and immunization. 
and uh, we don't have that that last thing yet. And the other thing that really uh, needs to be tied in for safe reopening, as we've discussed in the past, is having much more extensive testing. Uh, in the state and in Palm Beach County, I would say the number of somewhere between one and two percent of the population has been tested. So about 98 percent has not been tested. So we don't know uh, what percentage of people have been exposed. We don't know what percentage of people uh, may be walking around and being what they call asymptomatic, so no symptoms but still contagious, or perhaps just someone who exposed and now has antibodies. And so there's a lot of unknowns. I go back to that word uncertainty, but uh, hopefully we'll be moving in a direction where there will be a lot more of that testing available, and then that's going to have to tie into something called contact tracing. Already there's a lot of movement to, to begin to establish that, and that's basically tracking any of the people that came in contact with someone who's tested positive. So there's a lot of moving parts. I will say there's still a great deal of uncertainty, but I do believe that we're moving with, with, a, with a good amount of caution. Uh, just to mention a couple other things, um, any new treatments out there? Well, we know uh, Lysol is not particularly useful, and I'm not being sarcastic here. Uh, I, I read something today about somebody, uh, a study where they're using intravenous stem cells. I'll tell you, in medicine, stem cells is one of those things that's very questionable gray area. It works in, in certain conditions, in certain cancer conditions, but it's uh, amongst entrepreneurs, a lot of people are using that for everything. So I see that out there now. Also, who knows uh, where that's going to go. There was another study uh, mentioned that Pepsid, thimatidine, which is... Uh, uh, H2 antihistamine blocker used for uh, gastric problems. Uh, that stems from some work that apparently came out of China where they saw that patients who had heartburn fared better and they were people who were taking Pepsid. So that of course was a big thing in the news a day or two ago. Uh, in New York, they're actually doing a study with uh, formatidine Pepsid. But the tricky thing is even though they said they're doing a uh, double blind controlled study, uh, most of the patients at that particular hospital where we're doing the study have already been experimenting with the antimalarial plaquenil, which is the other thing now where, again, we're getting some very mixed results as to whether that's really useful. So it's gonna be confusing that you have these patients all on two drugs that we don't really know if they work, just testing to see if they work. So we're, I think, uh, not really uh, close to saying that we have something that works, but there's a lot of people trying things. And I think because of the technology and because of the internet, we're able to hear about all this uh, preliminary work much earlier than we might have heard about this five or 10 years ago, which has its ups and downs. You know, this way we, we know about what's going on, but a lot of it is premature. People will hear about things and they'll get desperate and they'll want to try things that maybe uh, not only don't help, but uh, might, uh, hurt them. So we have, we have to proceed uh, pretty cautiously there. Uh, so that, that's pretty much the update on, on what's going on there. I, I think we're, we're moving into the next portion of our program. We're going to be looking at some of the uh, issues that are related complications, not physical complications directly, but related complications, particularly in a social setting related to the COVID situation. And uh, Ken, who, who do we have on the, on, on the uh, conference now? Do we have everybody? Before we, head there, before we head there, Brent, I want to make sure there, see if there's some questions for you. Sure. I, know I have one or two, but okay. I want to see if any of the other participants have some questions. If so, please unmute your phones and go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, yeah. So, so the, only, the only thing that's open is just parks and um a few other things right but no everything else like you said beaches are closed and salons and gyms are, are all closed in palm beach county correct correct okay okay oh okay all right we'll have to wait <laughs> yeah i know they uh i'm right across the street from uh, bert aronson's south county regional park and today's the first day they've dropped the tapes and we can now access the park so uh, some of us with, with the proper apart. social distancing <laughs> yeah as long as we stay six feet apart and everything else any other questions 
Uh, this is Karen. Yes, I do have a question. I noticed there was a very lengthy news article yesterday about two hospitals, Mount Sinai and Johns Hopkins, reporting a lot of these young patients are having strokes. Yeah, there has been uh, some data and some research that uh, is out there now suggesting that part of the uh, disease process may have something to do with uh, interference in the clotting mechanisms. So uh, it's, again, one of the advantages now that we have uh, with, with the internet and the availability to share this data very quickly. So it's an area where I, I know my colleagues and a lot of researchers are looking into, again, part of the physiologic process of, of, of what may be going on here. I have a question. Um, I heard on the news tonight that uh, the Florida medical examiners may not be reporting all the deaths, that they have to be submitted first to some uh, body that the uh, Governor DeSantis has set up uh, to be reviewed, and they may not, they, there's a feeling that they may be undercounting the number of deaths in Florida. Yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. I, I was talking with uh, one of my colleagues earlier today, and we were reflecting on our, our days back in uh, medical school and internship when we were in the hospital when there were deaths. Uh, a lot of the data was not really particularly accurate. You know, we would always sign off with the same thing, that it was a death due to uh, uh, something uh, cardiovascular related with atherosclerotic heart disease. So most of the death certificates kind of had these uh, uh, diagnoses just to kind of move on. And uh, we're kind of concerned about the accuracy of the death. So on the one hand, as you referenced, it could be that uh, not all that data is getting counted, so it may actually be higher than that. But on the other hand, the way that hospitals are reimbursed, okay, they get more for a COVID patient. So we also understand that perhaps more people are being given this diagnosis because it's economically uh, advantageous. So, uh, you know, hopefully if you average all of that information, we still come up with something that's relatively close to the reality of the situation, but there's a lot of room for uh, a certain degree of inaccuracy for sure. I have a question, um, Dr. Sessinger, in, in the um, Florida plans of uh, stages of opening, is there any, uh, are they factoring in the potential uh, expectation of a resurgence of, of um, COVID-19 in the fall, uh, that that might be a pattern of this uh, virus? Well, that's, that's a very good question, and that's, that's brought up a lot. And from what uh, the information I get secondarily about the different panels that have been set up uh, on the county level and on the state level, that they certainly are, are considering that. They say they are. Uh, we, we've proven uh, with the uh, strategy, at least here locally, that we've been able to prevent having a big surge. And we know now what we would need to do if suddenly there were more cases. You know, based, you know, right, right now, I think the hospitals are working on like 30 or 40% occupancy. So there's lots of beds and there's lots of ICU facilities available right now. And to get back to that situation, if we had to, I believe we have uh, some pretty good infrastructure. And there's gonna be some very, hopefully, you know, I'm told there's gonna be some very close uh, data monitoring to make sure that the levels are going down. And if there's any indication that they're going in some other direction, we should be able to get back to the plan that we've established right now. So I have my fingers crossed. And I think, you know, I, at least here in the state of Florida, particularly in South Florida, I hear a lot of uh, really good feedback that there are a lot of smart people who are on top of that. They are paying attention to that. Okay, I just get a little concerned that our governors met with our president and-, and, I'm and they didn't wear masks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, if you look at some of the things that, uh, that uh, Governor DeSantis said just in the, in the press briefing that he had at five o'clock, it sounds, actually pretty responsible. So, you know, I just hope, you know, we can hold true to, to the statements there. So that's, that's gonna be an important thing to keep uh, an eye on. Thank you. And Brent, uh, 
from me. I know uh, you mentioned the Pepsid, uh, the drug that's in Pepsid. Then I understand there's some tests with that combined with the antimalarial drug, uh, trying to see if they can get some results from that. But I also heard something uh, more encouraging that, uh, and I forget the company now that's testing a vaccine. And it's so far made it to uh, where they're testing it on the monkeys. And the, the test group, the monkeys that were exposed to the virus that had been treated with this vaccine, none of them came down with the virus, but those who were all who were untreated came down with the virus. So uh, what does that mean to us? And how, I don't know if I'm exceeding your expertise here, but how close are we to human testing and, and coming forward? But that was Oxford. Oxford, thank you. Okay, uh, well, I know there's a lot of work being done as we speak. There's a lot of uh, people, a lot of uh, high level researchers scurrying around trying to come up uh, with something. And I believe I did uh, read the study that you're talking about. It's, it's just, it takes time. You know, once, once you see something positive uh, on an animal level, then it still has to be cleared for human testing. And then you still have to watch the response. Uh, you know, this virus amongst the uh, experts, the immunology experts, they seem to think we will be able to develop some type of vaccine. But again, it depends on, on who you ask because the COVID virus, uh, the common cold is a type of COVID virus and we've never been able to come up with a vaccine for that. Uh, we have HIV you know, after all these years, we've never been able to come up with a, a vaccine that's effective for that. It's a different type of virus, but they're viruses. So um, I, I think we have to really be patient. There's many steps here, and this is, this is the challenge. You read one study and go, terrific, we may be really close, uh, and then we may not be. So uh, the good news is there's lots of people doing the work, and as I mentioned before, with the technology, the communications technology that we have, uh, internet-based international communication, uh, we've got experts from all over the world on top of this. So that, that to me is encouraging. Uh, the individual reports, sometimes the information is a little premature in terms of uh, the uh, optimism. So we have to have be cautious optimism. Good, good. Okay, thank you, Brent. Any sure. further questions for Brent before we go to the next segment? Ken, it's, Ken, it's Nancy. I do have one question. Okay, go ahead, Nancy, and then I see uh, Brent, Brent, yes. what about the uh, medication? I think it's called Remsevir that has been approved for other things. It, it, one day you see positive comments, and the next day you, it sort of reverses itself. What, what is your opinion on that medication? It's okay. a treatment. Again, this I put into that category of the uncertainty. So Remdesivir is what you're referring to as anti- That's uh, it viral that uh, Gilead is the company that's working on it and Gilead has had a lot of success with antiviral products. Uh, they've made billions of dollars selling them but they've also had success developing uh, the, the hepatitis C medications for instance. Uh, uh, Truveda, you see the ads for that in the late night television uh, for HIV. So they've had a lot of success for that but this is, this is a drug that uh, was supposed to be something for Ebola, but it proved not effective, all right? So some of the preliminary studies have suggested it might be the answer, but uh, we've got to proceed cautiously because a lot of those studies are paid for by the drug company. Not to be too cynical, but I, I am realistic. Uh, the company Gilead, who has the patent on that, is doing the studies. So we have to really you know, hold that to a pretty high level before we say that we have an answer. But it's one of the ones I've been talking about for a long time. There's also a drug that's used for the common flu, the Tamivir. Okay, it doesn't seem effective on this, but uh, amongst some of the experts I've spoken to, there's hope that perhaps something similar in that category, they call them the Ramidase inhibitors, uh, where it actually prevents viral replication. It, it blocks the, uh, the cell so it doesn't shed viral particles. So that is another possibility, although uh, I tell you, even with common flu, 
there's controversy as to how good Tamiflu is as, as a medication. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts again here, but once again, I'll emphasize uh, there's a lot of people and, and talking to each other. Thank you. Okay, we'll do one more question with Trudy and then we'll move to the next segment. Trudy? Thank you. Yeah, I was concerned about uh, the prevention of the next wave and supposing um, we're asymptomatic. That doesn't mean that we don't have it. Is that correct? Correct. So, so then are we supposed to get these tests or not supposed to get these tests or we don't count as a COVID carriers or we do or we don't have it or can you clarify this mess? Yeah, the way I see it, you know, and there's two different types of testing. You have PCR, which is what most of the testing is now, which uh, looks to see if there's actually viral particles present. Then there's antibody testing, which is just beginning to emerge. I believe there's one company whose test uh, has been given FDA preliminary approval. They fast-tracked it and gave it approval. There's about uh -huh. 80 or 90 other companies uh, who applied for FDA approval. The antibody testing is probably going to be uh, the most useful because it can determine whether you were exposed to the virus. You know, unfortunately, since it's new technology here, we don't know exactly what it means. You know, it means you were exposed to it, but depending on the antibody levels, are you still contagious? Are you protected from the infection from someone else? But it can generate a lot of very good epidemiologic data, public health data, so we can have an idea. Uh, you know, I think moving forward, it's really critical to get an idea how many people have been exposed. You know, as I mentioned, with the uh, conventional testing, and uh, the county, particularly healthcare district, has done a great job. I think it was something like about 20,000 tests have been done already in Palm Beach County, but that is less than 2% of the population. So we don't know uh, what the other 98% is walking around with. So uh, the statisticians say maybe you need to test 15, 20, 25% of your population so you can tell what percentage. You know, and when we look at things like death rates or we look at infection rates, they really are only accurate if you have an accurate uh, denominator, right? So right now you might say uh, this percentage of people who have the problem uh, will die, will have a mortality. But we may have a huge number of people who've had the disease but never show any symptoms. And if we include all of those individuals, then we may be able to say, you know, the death rate is really fairly low. So uh, it's, it's a good question. And I think once we see antibody testing, which probably within, I think, Within the next few weeks, within the next month, that should be pretty widespread. Uh, there's also going to be home testing kits. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are going to be out there. But the other challenge is going to be how accurate are the results, and will there be false negatives, false positives? But at least there'll be data that we don't have at all right now. Thank you. Thank you, there. And Kristen and Betsy, they have been waiting so patiently. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that first segment as well. Oh, yeah. I want to check to see if Ms. Schroeder is on. Ms. Schroeder, are you here? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, too bad. Okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, Perhaps yeah. you'll join us later. So who's going first, Kristen or Betsy? Kristen, right? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm going first. And I really thought that I would be a follow up to um, Patricia Schroeder because she's the one that's really seeing how the phones are ringing off or not ringing off. Um, I'm not a necessary a, a specialist in this, but I did a lot of work to get some facts and, and find out some information on what's going on in our county with domestic violence and the pandemic. And even though people, many people, most people probably are working remotely now, I was able to touch base with several staff members at, at nonprofit organizations in Palm Beach County, United Way, AVDA, Aid to Victims of Domestic Abuse, and DCF, the Florida Department of Children and Families. I also listened to or watched several informative online panel discussions, interviews, and news reports about the problem. Now, um, I did hear a woman who runs a shelter down in Miami talk about her, her calls for help really rising lately. And I read a newspaper report that contrasted Palm Beach County with the Treasure Coast, where the Treasure Coast calls about domestic violence 
in the 70, up by 70 something percent. But the consensus really seems unanimous about, among service providers in our area that although the numbers of calls to hotlines have not increased, and in some cases have, have signif significantly decreased, the cases of domestic violence have increased due to the stress caused by the pandemic. The advice across the globe is to stay home, but home is not always a safe place. In fact, the social distancing and sheltering at home recommendations to keep us safe from COVID-19 infection have created the perfect situation for an abuser. Victims are trapped. They can't leave their homes as easily as they did when they went to jobs or for shopping. They're isolated from their family and friends and from whatever support systems they had created for themselves. Their abusers can keep close watch on their use of the phone to call hotlines or the police. Service providers also said that they've seen similar drops in calls during times when things in the world were unsettled, during national emergencies and natural disasters, 911 for example, or Hurricane Andrew. Those times were like ours now, times of great uncertainty as Dr. Schillinger was stressing. And people don't want to rock the boat any more than it's already been rocked. They cling to a semblance of stability, even though that stability could be toxic. They also think that the agency offices are closed and that the shelters are not taking in more persons and that help is not available to them. So as a result, victims are not reaching out for help, either because they can't get to a phone or because they've despaired that help is available. Providers expect to see a huge spike in demand for services after the public health emergency is over and victims can begin to seek help. But all the agencies I heard from want people to know that they are open now and that they are prepared to help and find safe emergency shelter for victims of domestic abuse, even in this uncertain time. DCF said that all 42 certified domestic violence centers in Florida are continuing to provide essential services during the pandemic. So I urge all of you tuned in this evening to help get that message out. The agencies have put the necessary measures in place to mitigate the health issues and ensure the safety of their clients and their staff. For example, they're doing counseling by telephone and video. They're maintaining appropriate distance between residents and shelters, and they're putting new residents in two-week quarantine. Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz held an excellent web stream conference on domestic violence last week. Most of the participants represented Miami-Dade or Broward, but what they said can almost certainly be generalized to Palm Beach County. One of the participants was a judge who specializes in civil restraining order hearings in Miami-Dade. She said that people are not accessing the courts and their services. There's been a 50% drop in requests for restraining orders during the pandemic. The judge stressed that help is available through the courts. They are open, intake centers are open, Victims can file for protective orders. It may take more time because of the use of new technology. For example, they're using the Zoom platform to handle remote hearings, but help is available. Clients can seek help from legal aid and other advocacy centers for assistance with the technical challenges, and there are kiosks at these centers to help them access the services of the courts. Child abuse and neglect are important forms of domestic abuse that mental health providers are seriously concerned about during the pandemic. Away from school and the after school community programs that sheltered them from abusive parents, children are now confined to their homes with adults who are further stressed by financial strains and fears for the future. Their classroom learning is now online, but children don't always have the necessary technical equipment computer equipment, or parents who have the technical savvy to help them, or well, the level of stress in the household goes up even higher. Some of the most important sources for reports to authorities of child abuse are teachers, school nurses, and staff in after-school programs. Children are not being seen outside of the school, outside of the home, in this critical way. 
Con Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz is working with school districts to have each school's crisis phone number and email address on the screen of all the online communication that comes to children when they're doing their homework, when they're looking at resources there so that they can access help. So what can we do to help? Jennifer Ray at AVDA encourages us to reach out to law enforcement if we see something or hear something that makes us concerned that domestic violence is happening in a home near ours. The victim may not have access to 911, so we need to call law enforcement and ask them to investigate. We also need, as I said before, to get the word out that the service providers are open and help is available to victims. Donations to all charities are going down in this period. So please consider making donations to your local providers. They need laptops for their clients so they can access online counseling and mediation. They need masks for their uh, staff and their clients. And knowing that they will have a surge of requests for services at the end of the pandemic, advocacy groups are also asking for suggestions for additional shelter housing. Now, I sent Ken some numbers that I asked him to do a PowerPoint on. I think you were going to make a slide of that, Ken. Ken? I did. I was muted oh, oh, as I was oh. trying to bring up those slides. If you give me just a second yeah. here, I can uh, let me get to them. To do, to do. So these are all 24-7 hotlines. And um, the one I found really interesting was the national, oops, up there. Yeah. There's a, no, that's not it. There, right. So I have the, the number for AVDA, the number for the YWCA of Palm Beach County's Harmony House, and the Flo Florida Domestic Violence Hotline. The National Dem Domestic Violence Hotline is there, but they also have a website that with chat capacity. And I put that website there. And they also have a texting system where if someone texts love is to 2252, it's a signal that that person needs help. So those are two ways that people can access help without picking up the telephone and having someone, you know, having their abuser hear them. So um, maybe you could jot those down. So that's, um, you know, what I found. I, as I said, um, it was mainly through reaching out to organizations here. I wanted to, he, I wanted to speak to. Um, legal aid in Palm Beach County, but I was not able to ever get through to someone, but I'm sure that they have, they're ready and waiting to help people once they start making the calls. And I did make some slides just to show some of the magnitude of the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the CDC and the National Institute intimate partner violence survey, they showed one in four women and nearly one in 10 men experienced some type of violence, physical, sexual, stalking, and something from their partners, which equates, uh, which goes on to talk about 43 million women, 38 million men experience some type of psychological aggression from their partners. Mm -hmm. And bring it a little closer to home, uh, Florida, with our population of 20, 21 million people, these are 2018 figures from FDLE. Uh, during 2018, they reported nearly 105,000 domestic violence offenses. Uh, you know, just to put it, give some context to the right. discussion, bring it a little closer to home, Palm Beach County, our population, 1.4 million reported 4,600 domestic violence offenses 
And just to take it one step further, it, here in, uh, in Florida, there were 562,000 abuse calls to the hotline and 855 children here in Palm Beach County were removed and placed into foster care. So it, it's not a new phenomenon. It is a problem in the state, in the nation, and locally. And what you're saying is during this time of uh, uh, isolation, folks staying at home, uh, we are we're in some areas seeing an uptick. So it is mm -hmm. a problem. And so I hope folks took notes of those resources that you made available that they can share with folks and friends and anyone who may need that. I had a question, you know, I, I read something that suggested that in this time of the corona, of the COVID-19, uh, that this is not actually making people commit domestic violence, but it's more probably exposing what has been there behind closed doors. Right, I read that, I read that, that. Yeah. I read that too, yeah, yeah. I have a question, Is what about the resource 211? As a hotline, is um, Kristen? Did you did you reach well, them? Well, that that was our our, our speaker tonight, <laughs> Patricia <laughs> Schroeder. <laughs> but to, oh, that yeah. Patricia. Yeah. Oh, I know her. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I so, thought of Pat Pat Schroeder, <laughs> our right. former she, representative. All right. No, no, no. But um, no, there was a two one one. Someone from two one one. So I was going to, you know, let them. She's very good. Yeah. 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 Well, 211 is the number that most people would dial first. Correct. Right. And then through 211, they can refer you to one of those agencies okay. that you had right. on your list right. there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And uh, Betsy. Yes. I've been asked to tell you about uh, the League's Lock It Up program. And with a generous uh, donation of a thousand gun locks uh, from the Palm Beach County Veterans Crisis Line. In October, the League's Gun Safety Committee initiated a gun lock distribution program. And the first event was the Palm Beach Sheriff's Department's National Night Out Against Crime, where two members of the committee who happened to be on this <laughs> Zoom call uh, distributed 48 gun locks that night. And then the Lock It Up project was officially launched in this January based on a model of the very successful uh, Broward League's gun lock program. We have a team of six members um, attending events and dis we distributed 95 gun locks at four events in January. Uh, I'm gonna show you a gun lock with the crisis line uh, information. And it comes in a little packet with uh, instructions on how to use it on several types of firearms. In February, 5,000 um, information cards in English, Spanish, and Creole were printed, imploring gun owners to store firearms safely and listing facts on gun violence and unintended tragedies. Uh, the League's email address is printed on the card so individuals and organizations can contact us receive free gun locks. And um, the 211 number, hotline crisis number, is also on the card. And in February and early March, uh, the team attended five events um, distributing um, information cards and 54 locks. The team makes calls to pediatricians, healthcare providers, mental health facilities and schools offering the information cards and guidelines um, uh, and for the gun locks for their distribution. And before the stay at home order was enacted, we were able to place gun locks and information cards at the Falk Counseling Center. And we have two schools in the pipeline for presentations and information when uh, schools open in the coming year. Now, although we've been stressing the locking of guns for child safety and um, suicide prevention, 
The statistics on the information cards also report that nine out of 10 women in the US killed by guns are killed by someone they knew. And that every 16 hours a woman is murdered by an intimate partner. But in speaking with representative of shelter for victims of domestic abuse, we learn that they avoid any encouragement of discussion on the topic of guns or gun locks or even self-defense courses as they feel these could put victims at increased risk. However, we now have an opportunity to be working with the Organization for Family Improvement in Lake Worth, the counseling center which offers court-referred domestic violence counseling and anger management classes. Currently, they're doing it by telehealth services, but this counseling center has requested a box of gun locks and information when they reopen. Um, the League's Health Care Committee most of you, uh, recently expressed interest in extending the Lock It Up program to the north uh, parts of the county as the efforts with our six members has, have been in South County locations. And while I have you all listening, listening, uh, the Lock It Up project needs your help with more contacts to health providers and more volunteers to make them. So if you have contacts and can make calls, uh, please get in touch with us so that these locks and information can be more widely distributed in this time when gun sales have risen. Our team will gladly see that you get the information in the locks and you can reach Kristen and me and the other team members through uh, the league's directory or at lockitup at lwvpbc.org, the address on our information cards. So hopefully with more volunteers, we can offer gun safety solutions to a wider range of people and health services. Thank you. Any questions? So are there any questions for Kristen and Betsy? So you mentioned something that we've heard a lot of uh, in the start of the whole uh, COVID situation is that gun sales went way up. Hmm. Okay, do you have any information? Uh, has there been uh, additional gun violence as a direct result of this or in anticipation of that? Um, what I've read in the newspaper was just the articles that uh, more sales happened before the stores were closed. But then, of course, I believe we heard that gun stores were considered essential and they were left <laughs> open. And uh, uh, so this is, but I haven't seen any information uh, as to the numbers or the increased um, gun violence. But I'm, I imagine that will be out. Yeah. Unfortunately. And Brent, uh, some contrasting factoids that I can't remember the exact source, but if you recall at the beginning of this crisis, we, ha we had a shortage of two essential items in s some people's uh, shopping list. One was a shortage of toilet paper and the other was a shortage of ammunition. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> True story, and I, I, I just thought that was pretty ironic. Yeah. But the other one was, I believe the report was the month of March was the first time in recent history where there were no student deaths at school as a result of gun violence. Oh. Mm -hmm. the school. Mm -hmm. So no student, because the schools are closed. Yeah. They're closed. The schools are closed. Part of March, they were still open, but the, still in the month. Wow, of that's a, it's a sad way to have that statistic, isn't it? I, I, I believe there have been some complaints about Nikki Free because she hasn't been uh, giving out the gun permits as fast as they want her to. She's been really looking into the people applying for gun permits, which is annoying uh, the NRA in Florida greatly. Good. <laughs> and I can report a, that you may have gotten from the newspapers anecdotally this week that Angela Williams, the founder of Mothers Against Murderers Association, 
has just lost an, another niece, a uh, 26-year-old mm -hmm. young woman who was the daughter of Tori, who was the nephew in 2003 that got Angela started when he got killed. So that means I'm, I'm a good friend of Angela, and I think this, this murder makes it um, over 20 people in her immediate in her family that have been killed by gun violence she lives oh. in, in west palm beach riviera beach she's neighbors right nearby um as of february she had been to over 400 funerals law enforcement calls on her when there's a tragedy because she knows how to comfort families in in such crises and and uh traumatized kids so it's unfortunately alive and still well in in Palm Beach County. Thank you for that, Arlene. Um, just a side note, as we get ready to close, to keep my commitment to keep you one hour or less, uh, mm -hmm. last week we had a speaker on talking about scams and cons and fraud and abuse. Uh, one just popped up in the paper and I just recently re I received an email about two days ago of one of the latest scams here in Palm Beach County. If any of you get an email where someone says they have hacked into your computer and have viewed the things on your computer and they are aware of the adult sites that you've been visiting and you've activated your mm -hmm. camera and if you don't send them, the amount they asked me for was $2,000 in Bitcoin. And they gave me the address to send two thousand dollars in bitcoin if i didn't do it within 48 hours they were going to release the information that they gleaned from my computer I, release it to who <laughs> when they hacked into it they say they also have my contact list or my address book <clears throat> so just to be clear I am not two thousand dollars lighter. I still have my. <laughs> I wonder if they're the same source that said that Hillary Clinton was a pedophile in a pizza place or something like that. <laughs> the absurd. Quite possibly, but these are just tactics that these, yes. uh, those folks are using to get our money. But folks, thank you for joining us. Next week, we'll be joined by Matthew Dietz and Kimberly Spire O. Esquire. They'll discuss the disparities with testing and treatment for people with disabilities. Future conversations for this telecom will be topics suggested by you, our participants, that affect our community. Nancy and Brent and team are working on scheduling speakers and, and good discussions for you in the upcoming weeks. I want to remind you all again that the census has, Census Bureau has kicked off the 2020 census. Don't miss this opportunity. If you haven't done so yet, this is the perfect time to complete the census for your household while most of us are still stuck at home. You can respond to the census today either online or by phone, all without having to meet with a census taker. Thank you for joining us this evening and thank you Brent, Ms. Murtaugh and Ms. Pickup for your insightful and informative discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to please join us every Wednesday. I have no idea when this is going to end, but um, as long as there's a need for information, we will keep providing you the information. But please join us every Wednesday at 6 p.m. as we travel the journey through the challenges of this crisis together. I'm Ken Thomas, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Palm Beach County and our health care committee, thank you and I ask that you please stay well, stay safe, and stay informed. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Seeing everybody. Yes, nice to see you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>